Um, appreciate everyone coming. This is the last uh, seminar for the spring. We'll be breaking for the summer, starting up again in the fall. If anyone is interested in presenting in the fall, I have started scheduling people, so please let me know um, if you or anyone in your lab is interested. I'm always looking for speakers. So today, I'm pleased to present Huey Jane from uh, Biostatistics, who's going to talk to us about unit-free and robust detection of differential expression from RNA-seq data. And there's a sign-in sheet going around, so if you can sign that, uh, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you all for coming today. Um, I really like this uh, uh, seminar series. I benefit a lot from it, so very glad that I can contribute back to it. So, um, so today, I'm, you know, even though the title looks like fancy, but today I'm just going to talk about a very simple, or put it this way, very basic problem. All of you know very, very, very well about it. So the and I, it's a very short talk, only 20 page. So I'm going to basically, I, I like to have sort of like a discussion to really learn from both of, uh, both of us. So even though this is a very basic problem, and uh, people propose many different approaches to it, surprisingly, to my understanding, there's not a satisfactory approach even nowadays. So I'm going to put away my understanding and my approach, but still it's not perfect. So discussion, welcome. Um, OK. <laughs> Have this one. Maybe here is that. So I'm sure all of you know RNA very well by this time of the, you know, development. So I go through very briefly. This is RNA We take our, uh, mRNA from the sample, break it down into small fragments due to the limitation of the sequencing technology, uh, and uh, then you know, prepare the library and go to sequence it. In the end, we got the, the reads, right, and uh, is RNA is popular because a lot of advantage. It's high throughput, you know, getting cheaper and cheaper, and uh, give supposedly better measurements of gene expression than microarray. Uh, wide dynamic dynamic range, you know, accurate digital counts, and also, you know, is capable of doing things that are novel, like novel transcripts, novel splicing, uh, gene fusion kind of thing. But even though the talk today is, we're going to talk, not going to focus on that. So we're going to talk about this basically basic problem, how do we quantify gene expression from RNA-seq data. So a typical pipeline for you know, processing RNA-seq reads are like this. We first map the reads to the genome or trans uh, transcripts. Then we summarize the reads you know, for each gene or each axon, how many reads you got. And then we quantify gene expression. There are a number of software out there. You can, you can use whatever the results are more or less similar. And then you summarize your data, do some sort of normalization, and uh, then depending on your, your study design, do differential expression analysis. I mean, this is a very general <coughs> term. It could be like a two sample comparison, could be multiple sample comparison, but if you have the outcome is like a continuous, you could run a linear model here. Basically, by differential expression analysis, I mean you do the statistical analysis, trying to find a gene which is of interest <coughs> to your uh, biological study, okay? So today I'm going to focus on this single thing, normalization. But turn out this to be critical because it lies between quantification and you know follow-up study. And turn out that my understanding is that normalization is so critical that it should be uh, incorporated together with this study. Okay. So this is a card home demonstrating what kind of uh, data we got from RNC, right? So we prepare several biological samples. We might change, they might come from different conditions. One could be controlled, one could be treated. You also have replicates, you know, trying to control for the biological variation. Then you do the sample prep. Then you sequence. In the end, you know, after you map the reads, you count, you got a table, right, like this. So basically for each gene, suppose we are only interested on in the gene level. For each gene, we got number of reads from that sample. So this is a table uh, <coughs> supposedly to be, has like, 25,000 lines because there are 25,000 genes. We have one table per sample, another table, another sample, right? These are the data we got. We, our statistical analysis start from here. So this is the data analysis. We want to basically, based on this data from the RNC <coughs> experiment, we want to go back trying to make inference on the original sample. What's going on in the original you know, sample? You know, what gene has changed and things like that. Okay, and uh, this was the, among the very first paper for RNA-seq in 2008, 
And uh, they, they basically deal with the problem how do you quantify gene expression from RNA. And the idea is very simple, right? So after you align the reads back to the gene, so it's say this gene, gene one in experiment one has six reads, and so on and so forth. And different experiments could have different total number of reads due to a lot of uh, technical issues or you know, costs. So basically, how do you use this read count to quantify gene expression? And these people, they propose this RPKM in this, their very first paper for RNA-seq, but it's still the most widely used approach to quantify gene expression. It's as simple as this. You take the number of reads for that gene, you divide by the length of the gene. Some people correct for the boundary effect, things like that. But basically, you divide by the length of the gene. Then you divide by the total number of reads for that experiment. Some people use the total number of reads you know, mapped. Some people use the total number of reads, you know, regardless of map or not. No matter what, you, you divide by these two, you got an RPKM. And they show that RPKM works pretty well as the gene expression level. You can use RPKM for downstream, downstream analysis, like differential expression. You know, things work pretty well for this simple approach. But if you look, you know, this was never mentioned in the paper, but if you think it, you know, harder, you think it through, you'll see that the RPKM approach actually made lots of assumptions. First of all, it assumes that each gene has a well-defined length to divide, right? It's not true because each gene, we know that they have many alternative splice transcripts. They have different lengths, right? So people develop, you know, approaches trying to take into consideration of that, decompose the, all the reads from the gene into different isoforms. You know, there are software doing that, which is not a focus today. But, you know, uh, there are some improvement over this assumption. Also, the, the number two assumption, by dividing the length of the gene, these people are assuming that, you know, basically you've got a uniform sampling from at every transcript, at every position, right? This turned out to be, again, not true technically, but close to be true. But there are, again, a lot of kind of bias, like three prime bias, like all the you know, non-uniformity. There are approaches and software trying to deal with that. Again, this is not the focus today. And assumption number three only happens when you use, when you directly use the RPKM for downstream analysis. If you use that, for example, you quantify RPKM from a sample and use that number as the gene expression level from that sample, then you compare that gene across many different samples directly without doing additional normalization, then the assumption you're making is that actually the total amount of nucleotides is constant across samples. So this is very actually tricky because there are other things besides RPKM that make different assumptions. This assumption you know, is, is a, apparently it's not 100% <coughs> true, but it's close because most of the time the sample we compare come from the same cell type. You, know, you, you, you imagine the cell have similar size, similar molecular weight, so their physical mass is about the same. So it's not too far away. <coughs> so there are many approaches parallel to RPKM trying to improve on that. For example, some people directly use the read count for differential expression. They build all sorts of a count model like Poisson or negative binomial kind of model. Some people normalize the count by the sequencing library depth, but not by the gene length. Some people, you know, this FPKM is essentially RPKM just taking care of the, the read pairs. And some people argue that RPKM is not good because the RPKM value is not essentially what you want for gene expression. They further normalize the RPKM value within the library, within the sample. They call it the TPM. So basically, it's normalized RPKM within the Sample. So all of these are sort of, I call them different units for data summarization, but other people, actually some people call them normalization. We can call them within sample normalization because when you do this, you look at one sample at a time. Okay? So they argue that TPM is better than RPKM because TPM tells you the relative percentage of the transcript. Basically, if you sample one million transcript in that particular sample, how many copy that you sample for a particular transcript? They argue this is better. But my understanding is that this is just making a slightly different assumption than the RPKM. If you remember, the RPKM assumes that the total <coughs> molecular weight of the two cells are the same, while the TPM assumes the total number of transcripts of the two cells are the same. And then you may argue one assumption is better than the other, but to me, they are sort of arbitrary assumptions. Okay. Now I talk about the, the major point, you know, triggers all this called kind of work is that RNA-seq measurements are intrinsically relative. Not only RNA-C, actually, microarray, QPs are all the same. They are intrinsically relative in the sense that you can only measure gene expression relative 
within a sample. So if you got gene expression value for one gene is two, the other gene is one, you say that the other, you know, the first gene is twice as abundant as the second one within that sample. When you compare the gene expression across sample, you have to make assumption because it's this uh, intrinsic relativeness. Here I will demonstrate. Suppose this is what happened in, in the in the biological sample, right? So this gene is 2.5 times abundant as the first one, and so on and so forth. And this is your uh, data after your sequencing. Here I use RPKM, but you could use any other unit I mentioned earlier. Basically, you know, you get the, here I just use the same number to illustrate that, okay, you could get a good estimation on the relative abundance. So what if in another sample, due to some treatment, we upregulate one gene. So this gene go from 2 to 4.5, about two-fold up. Other genes are more or less the same, not affected by the treatment. Okay, so that's the uh, ideal, uh, I mean, hypothetical idea of this treatment. Then after you sequence, and no matter how deep you sequence, no matter how you summarize the data using whatever approach you, I mentioned earlier, this is about what you get. So this gene will be higher than the other one, but not as high as it, it, what it really was in the biological sample. And all other genes will go lower. <coughs> and the, the reason is very simple, because all of these transcripts that compete for the sequencing reads. Right? If one transcript goes more abundant, it will get more reads. And relatively, all other transcripts will get fewer reads. So in the end, no matter how you summarize the data, this is what you get. If you compare this to this, you will see all the genes are changing, even though in reality only the last one is changing. And this won't, this problem won't be solved even though you have replicate. Mm -hmm. Replicates perform similarly. That's why actually this is a problem not only to RNA When you do qPCR, when you do microarray, you also have to normalize with something. You have to assume something is not changing across uh, conditions, like the housekeeping gene. That's why when you do qPCR, you use the housekeeping gene. But you're assuming the housekeeping gene are not changing. You really rely on assumption. So here is another view of this problem. So this is the true fold change of all the genes. Say most of the genes didn't change before and after the treatment. Their true fold change, change center around one. And a small group of genes, say they go up by two fold. So that's the underlying true fold change before and after the treatment. This is what you get by observing the fold, observe the fold change in the data. So you know the, the, the group of genes really go up. They still go up, but not by twofold, but less than twofold. And the majority of the gene will go down a little bit because this this relativeness. And the normalization is basically trying to uh, find a baseline, trying to correct for that. Otherwise, if you don't do normal, if you don't do between sample normalization, you will uh, you will think all the genes are changing basically, and that's wrong. And this is why the between sample normalization is essential, and there are so many approaches developed for that. For example, the most popular approach for microarray is called of normalization is called quantile normalization. It assumes you basically the the gene expression distribution in the biological sample across different conditions are the same. It's a very very strong assumption, so that the result is quite robust, but also you lost a lot of signal because the, the fold change will be skewed, biased and so on and so forth. But they have to do that because if you see here, RNA-seq, you know, even though it's relative, but it's relative, it's relative within the sample, right? But for microarray, a lot of uh, problem happens because for very low abundant gene or for very high abundant gene, there are either background noise or saturation. So it's not like you can shift everything easily. So quantum normalization performs really well in microarray data. Then for RNA-seq data, starting from RPKM, you can think RPKM as some sort of normalization, right? Then TPM is another kind of normalization. And then people find those are not robust because in RPKM or TPM, if one transcript or a small group of transcripts for some reason uh, absorbs a lot of reads in one sample, then all other genes in that sample will go down. And that's not good. So people want to correct for, for that. So instead of using the total count of that library, they use, for example, the upper quartile, the 75% quartile. Basically, remove all the genes which are very, very abundant for whatever reason. Use the 75% quartile, but you could also use the median, 
whatever, you know, result will be different but the same, uh, similar. Then, you know, these two are the very uh, popular approach for differential expression, and they propose different kind of normalization approach. It's fairly ad hoc and uh, you know sophisticated, but the idea is basically to make the normalization robust. For example, in edge R, they use the trim the mean. We know that the mean Normalized by the mean is the same as normalized by the total sum. It's not robust. But if you trim the mean, basically throw away everything, you know, change a lot on the two extreme. Use the, the middle part is more robust. <coughs> and then this one use the median. The median is more robust than the mean. We all know that. So they basically they propose this kind of normalization. <coughs> and why? Because you, you probably agree with me by now is that normalization is very essential for downstream differential expression. If you don't normalize well, the downstream analysis, no matter what method you use, will not be reliable. And uh, up to here, uh, some people actually brought up this idea. Since normalization and differential expression are actually intrinsically the same problem. Because ideally, if you know what genes are changing, what genes are not changing, you should only use the genes that are not changing to normalize. Right? But if you don't normalize well, you cannot get the second problem solved. So actually, they are two sides of the same problem. So why not model them the same way? So uh, Lee et al., they propose this iterative normalization. Basically, they use whatever method to start with and uh, to do differential expression. And then use the gene which are recognized as non-differential expressed, then do the normalization. Then iterate until converge. OK, this method works pretty well. and uh, it was actually also proposed even back to 10 years ago for microarray stuff. But this kind of method never got really popular. And uh, the reason is, first of all, in most of the data set, it doesn't really make much difference. OK, the difference is very subtle. And also, typically when people use the iterative methods, you are trying to optimize some sort of function. But it's unclear what function this, this iterative method is optimizing. Without knowing the function it is optimizing, it's very hard to understand how it works. And uh, in particular, this method, even though it doesn't make much difference, it actually depends on the initial point. So if you start from a different initial point, you end up with different solution. So because you know this, it, it is, just because we don't really know understand what this is doing, so that you know we don't really want to approach which depends on the initial guess. And then, of course, you can use house, housekeeping gene, but there are also arguments what gene to use, right? There's a lot of arguments. So basically, there are so many methods proposed for this problem, but it's not fully solved. So to understand the limitation of between sample normalization, let's imagine this simple scenario where in this sample, 50% of genes are not affected by the treatment. The other 50% are affected by the treatment, and they go up by twofold. OK, so this is the true fold change. And uh, accordingly, this will be your observed fold change. But in another study, supposedly 50% of genes are not affected by the treatment, but the other 50% are affected by the treatment and going down by two fold. So this is the true fold change. If you compute observed fold change, you will see that they have exactly the same distribution on the observed fold change. Basically, these two samples are the same except that their gene expression level are off by two times. Since RNA-seq only give you relative measurements, from your data, they seem equally likely. But in these two cases, here, this 50% of genes are non-differentially expressed. Here, the other, this is the opposite. The other half of the gene are not changed. So this is the limit of RNA-seq, or you call it a between sample normalization. If this is what's happening, no one can really know what gene are changing. Because this is ex uh, exactly the opposite, and their data, they give you exactly the same data. OK? So one simple way to get rid of this effect is basically to assume, no matter what you do, less than 50% of the gene are changing. Right? That's essentially the assumption that this median or mean approach they are making. OK, if you have more than 50%, you cannot do trim the mean. right? You cannot trim off like 50% from one end. OK. So if you go back to this, 
So if you look at this, the only thing we need to do for normalization is to find this baseline. If we can know that this was the baseline, then problem solved. So all of this different approach, just trying to find the baseline. The mean might be here. The median might be close by. The trim the mean might be close by. But none of them actually give you this, this, this true baseline. The only thing give you the true baseline is the mode. <coughs> but no one really tried that. And the, all of these are hypothetical. This is what's happening in real data. If you have real RNA seq data, you compute a fold change based on our reads. This is the kind of fold change, right? So how to pick the baseline? Because if you change the baseline, all the DE and non-DE gene will be changing, right? So shall we use the trim the mean, the median, or perhaps the mode? No one really knows you know, which one is better. It depends on the underlying, because we're making different assumptions. But it, it seems like the mode works better than the other, the, the rest. So that's how. That's the, the central idea of, of my approach. And uh, it's just, you know, in practice, you cannot directly compute the fold change and take the mode. You, you could do that, but it's not ideal, because the fold change has uncertainty in it, right? Because there's a sampling, there's a randomness. If you do the experiment twice, the fold change will change a little bit. The mode might shift a little bit. You want to incorporate everything in the same statistical framework. But the essential idea is just use the mode as the, uh, as the baseline. And the use mode as the baseline doesn't solve the problem of the limitation here, right? Because at this case, you have two modes that are equally high. You don't know which one to pick. However, this is only hypothetical. In reality, it's, I think it's never happening that you have 50% of the gene are changing caused by the treatment, and they all go up by exactly twofold. You can never make that happen, right? So even though you have more than 50% of the gene are changing in reality, they probably go up or down at different folds. So basically, this, this peak will be flattened down, and the remaining peak will stay up high. That's why the mode actually will work. So in practice, the mode approach actually can works even though you have more than 50% of the gene are changing. And uh, it doesn't matter whether they are go up or down symmetrically or asymmetrically. It doesn't affect. But those affect other approach quite a bit. Okay. So this is essentially our idea. We, we, we just put up this model, which solves both the normalization and the differential expression <coughs> simultaneously. OK? And uh, it's quite robust, doesn't rely on the assumption you know, the other methods are making. And uh, as a side product, as a byproduct, this approach is independent of the unit. Remember that all the data summarization, including read counts, CPM, RPKM, TPM, this model doesn't really care. Whatever unit you summarize your data, you put in this model, the inference are exactly the same, are identical. Which it, I think is nice because nowadays, you know, sometimes you don't get the raw data. You get some summarization from other people. And it's really hard to transform or convert between different data summarization. And if different data summarization give you slightly different results, that's annoying. But this one doesn't, it's not affected by the unit. So you, you can give me basic RPKM, TPM, counts, whatever. I just plug in. Results the same. So this is a simple model. Here, let's for simplicity just talk about the two sample comparison problem, just the essential the t-test kind of a study. So we, we assume that you know in the first group, uh, the log transform the gene spectral value is normally distributed with a gene specific variance, with a gene specific mean, and with a library depths of, you know, basically baseline, which we don't know. All of these are unknown. In the second group, we have the same variance, and the baseline is shifted by a gamma. So if gamma is zero, which means the two groups have the same baseline for the gene, which means the gene is non-differentially expressed. If gamma is non-zero, which means the gene is differentially expressed. So in the end, we just want to know what gamma is zero or non-zero, or we can rank them by, the, by their value of gamma, which is the fold change, because this is on the log scale. So gamma is the log fold change, exactly. So you can, we can easily put together a model of it. But it turns out, we, if you're just trying to put this model, the problem is not solvable, because it's over-parameterized, too many parameters. So we have to add a constraint, basically to pick among all the possible models, explain the data equally well, pick the most parsimonious model, basically with the smaller number of genes are differentially expressed. 
That's why we put a penalty here. It's a, a L0 penalty. Basically, we want to pick the model which has the smallest number of differentially expressed genes. And then we just maximize this function. This is the log likely, penalized log likely function. We maximize this function, we get everything. OK. The difficulty is that if you know this penalized model optimization, you know that L1 L0 penalty is very hard to optimize because this whole function is, is non-convex. And uh, it's actually high dimensional non-convex. But turn out that this specific model has this specialty in, in the sense that you, we can actually transform it into a one-dimensional non-convex function, which can be easily solved using an exhaustive search. Okay, you cannot solve non-convex problem in high dimensional in general, but one-dimensional is not a problem. So this is how we solve it. Basically, you, you first normalize within group, then you normalize between group, you know, determine the threshold. Remember here it's alpha, it's a threshold. Picking the threshold is always hard. In, uh, in this kind of a penalized regression, but it turned out that the alpha is linked back to the t statistic for each gene across two samples. So we just used, the, for example, the, the typical t statistic uh, alpha level. We can get a corresponding alpha. So we don't have to choose the cutoff. And in the end, once we have this, we have uh, essentially this one dimensional normalization problem to solve, uh, one dimensional non convex problem to solve. And once we solve it, we can go back, get all the gamma and the mu and so on, everything. So we got. OK. <clears throat> so first we do a simple simulation. So we simulate from our model. We have 1,000 genes. You know, we pick uh, 100 out of the 1,000 genes, and we let them change. Basically, they either go up, go down, random change. And this is the gamma. Soft. Let's run out of battery. This is a gamma soft by our method. Basically, tell us 900 genes are not changing. The remaining 100, most of them are changing. If their change are too small, we consider them not changing. Okay, and then we push the boundary. Here we let 400 genes are changing. No problem, and the, the change go asymmetric. So all the genes go up. At this moment, actually, other methods start to fail because they somehow, if you consider the median or mean approach, they somehow assume the fold change are symmetric. But here, they go all, all of them go up. Our method still works. Find the baseline, find the differential expression gene. Then we push it further. We let 700 gene go up. We still find the baseline. So this is very, very hypothetical. It doesn't happen in reality, but all other methods fail at this moment. And uh, if we push further, we let 900 gene change, our method fail as well. So basically, you know, this is an unsolvable problem at some degree, but we push the boundary slightly further. So this simulation is too ideal. <coughs> then we do another simulation and compare with other methods. So this time we simulate from our model, the log normal model, and trying to simulate realistic all sorts of a scenario. For example, this figure reads like this. We have 30% of the gene are differentially expressed in the simulation, and uh, we add no outlier to it. Because a lot of times you can add an outlier. For example, pick a gene, give a very, very big count to see whether one of the methods will fail. Here we don't add an outlier yet. And among the 30% gene are changing, we let 50% go up, 50% go down randomly. Okay? And uh, these are basically the number of genes detected as differentially expressed and the number of you know, false discoveries. So you want a flat line, which is perfect. So basically, thank you. This is too small to see, but we compare it to all other existing popular methods. Basically, this, this scenario is too simple, right? 30% change, symmetric, no outlier. So all the method performs similarly. And uh, similarly for other cases. So even though we have 70% gene are changing, if the change is fully symmetric, other methods actually works. If you find a mean or median, it works. But in the case that we have asymmetric fold change, or we have more than 50% gene are changing, 70%, you know, 70% asymmetric, the green line is our method. All other methods perform like this. Because if you fail to pick up the baseline, you fail to do differential expression. And this 
this is a summary of the table. So we have different percentage of gene are changing at different uh, percent of gene going up or down at a different percent of outliers. <coughs> and uh, these are the AUC of all four methods, edge R, DEC, lima, and the, uh, so the lima was developed for, for microarray, but recently people find this performs actually equally well as other methods for, for RNC. So the, this under, underlying AOC are the, the best performed one. So we will see that in the easy case, all the methods perform very well. So in this case, for example, edge R performed the best, but all other methods perform almost the same, right? But in cases that is very difficult, our methods still get 80% AUC, but all other methods get less than 50% AUC. You know that when you have less than 50% AUC, you basically, you perform worse than random guess, right? So this is the simulation from our model, the log normal model. You probably know that this one assume, also assume a, a normal model. If you apply this one on a log transform expression, it's basically log normal. This two assumes negative binomial. So we also similar ne negative binomial data, and the result is similar. So basically, no matter how you model the data, the, the problem is still there. So finally, we do a real data experiment. We pick two samples from the SEQC project. One, I think, is the, the brain sort of a tissue. The other one is a 16 human tissue combined. So if you compare these two samples, almost all the genes are changing. You know, there's very small percentage gene which may not be changing. You call them housekeeping gene or what, and so, and so on. So to solve the problem, we, we pick 20,000 genes out of this 25,000 gene from these two samples. Each one has four replicates. And we can consider them, since they come from totally different tissue, we consider them as differential expressed. Then we take the remaining gene and as non differential expressed, and we take the read counts from the replicates from the same tissue, so that they are from the same tissue. We know they are not changing. So we, now we know the, the ground truth. <coughs> 5,000 uh, uh, 5, are not changing, 20,000 are changing. You see that this is the extreme case. And we compare all the methods. So this is the result. This is the AUC of our method. This is the AUC of all three other methods. So we, basically, we know that all, there are actually several comparisons of differential expressing uh, software recently. And they, basically, the conclusion is that all of them perform similarly. Some are better in some occasions, some are not. And this, uh, it's the same conclusion here. And this is the AUC, our is better. The false positive rate are always much better. The false negative rate are all similar because there are genes uh, which are changing, but we don't, we didn't pick it up. Okay. How do you pick your 5,000 genes? Random. So it, it, it distributed over expression yeah. range. Ra randomly pick from the 25,000 25, genes. So you can think the, the full change probably be more or less symmetric. But still, it's not uh, perfectly symmetric. So that's that's about it. And this is only for two group comparison. But you can push it further for multiple group comparison. You can do like a linear model kind of thing. But for the, for the linear model case, the the optimization turned out to be very difficult. Or you can replace L0 by L1. Then that leads to convex optimization. Then you can solve it numerically, but it's less robust than the L1, L0 uh, penalty. So this is the joint work with my student, Tian Yu Zhang, in the Biostat, who is also here today. And uh, we have a manuscript available online in the archive, and uh, Tian Yu is also developing an ARC, R package. So if you're interested, we can send you the, the source code for you to practice. Thank you all. Any questions? What do you do with genes that have zero expression, zero counts? Oh, we just zero in, in one sample, not both. Yeah, it doesn't matter. I mean, to take log, you have to add something to it. So, for example, we add one to it and take okay, log. So it's still like zero. pseudo count, in essence. Yeah, basically, yeah. Yes. We we don't do anything special, and none of the other software do anything special with them. I think VMware <coughs> uses a signal to noise estimation that they use to, they still use, they don't use pseudo counts of whether it's best. Yeah, different methods use different approach, right? Say, 
this one I think is using the the, uh, the R, RPM. This one is is using the counts, but also adjusted by the library size estimator using an ad hoc approach. Uh, this one also used the log transformance expression value, same as here. But we take the log transform expression value, but the expression value can be in anything. You can take, you can put in the log transform counts here as an expression value. We give you the same result. So we, the performance is better because you simulated uh, asymmetric signals. That's where the performance is gained uh, because this other right. methods fail to consider that. Could, could the user, um, just in the QC phase, look at the distribution of the two groups and uh, get a hint of something that's asymmetrical and start to, to be alarmed about it? Yeah, this is about what typical you get. Right? You can call it a symmetric, you can call it asymmetric. It's, it's never perfectly symmetric. And the, the, we also compare for this kind of typical routine case, basically all the methods perform <clears> similarly, <throat> even though the top genes are not exactly the same list. But basically, you know, the signal is basically there, right? You, if you know the baseline, you normalize against the baseline, you, you compute the t-test, result is already there. The, the lemma works as well as all other packages. So in that case, actually all the software are similar. That's what I can say. You are absolutely right. You can you can do an empirical lookup. At this, right? this is typical what you get. What I'm thinking is, if the user is a, a very experienced user, always look at the distribution of the two groups. And when they are grossly different, this user should be quite alarmed and be very hesitant to do um, quantum normalization or trim the mean. And they probably want to uh, advise the biologists that there is a tremendous issue regarding where to shift the baseline. Yeah, and that happens actually in practice. For example, in the project that uh, uh, Steve we work on the, on the muscle uh, sequencing RNA seq, yeah. we got different percentage of, of uh, mitochondrial reads in different muscle sample runs from like ten percent to fifty percent. That actually buys all other reads. It's very hard to decide at that moment what to do. You, you ignore them, you include them, change the results. Right. So, so then, why do you think the parsimonious assumption is best in a real situation? What if the real case is when you do have a higher number of uh, differentially expressed genes than your minimal solution that's uh, pulled out? Yeah, yeah, you will fail at that moment. I, my, I think is that if you know for sure a group of genes are not changing, like you know for sure the housekeeping gene, you should go with the housekeeping <coughs> gene. This approach is basically trying to artificially or uh, algorithmically pick up a set of genes, smaller set of, uh, actually larger set of genes as housekeeping gene. So try to find <coughs> the largest set of genes which are not changing uh, uh, between the groups. Have you tested housekeeping genes specifically from, you know, <clears throat> from real data? Just because, you know, like, how much change is there really in that? People, uh, we didn't test, it. but from some paper I read is that, you know, the, the most of the housekeeping genes, they can easily change by twofold between different samples. And the twofold is a lot in, in differential expression. So one gene is never, uh, reliable. You need a set of housekeeping genes. How do you tune a parameter alpha? You have a yeah, it turns out that this this alpha will de be basically determine the lambda. The lambda will determine whether you you uh, truncate this one to zero or not. And in the end, if you look at this uh, cutoff. It turned out to be exactly the same form as the t statistic of that gene in the two sample. So basically, it's the normalized difference in the expression, average expression level in the two sample. So in the end, we use the t statistic, use the you know 0.05 or 0.05, depending on how you pick it. We use 0.05, uh, 0.95 uh, alpha level for the t statistic to determine the alpha. 
So we're not doing anything like a cross-validation kind of thing. But you have to pick alpha, yes. So a thresholding is actually the pick of the double ones. Yeah, basically, Zero, right? basically if the normalized difference of, in the two samples are small enough, you consider it's non-differential threat mm -hmm. at zero, right? So the alpha basically tell you the thresholding cutoff level, right? basically. What about the other idea that use uh, the so-called rank invariant <coughs> subset to normalize? Yeah, that, that's that's another <coughs> idea as well. Yeah, uh, there are also other pro uh, other. Uh, paper. I mean, this normalization issue, as, as I mentioned, was there in, in the microarray data as well, right? Some people pick the largest set of genes, which they keep their rank between the two conditions, right? This works also okay. I, I think basically for the easy case, all the methods work, work similarly, right? For the difficult case, I have I haven't compared to that because there are too many methods out there. But I think for the difficult case, this one is at least as good as any other method. That, that could help with the asymmetric tails, I think. Okay. It could, yeah. But that's also, that approach is very, I think it's very smart, and uh, but it's, it's still a little bit, I, I would say, ad hoc, in the sense that you don't know what function you're maximizing. I like to put a framework, at least this is a likelihood function. right? So if, you're, if your assumption sort of is true, then this gives you the, the best solution. But it all depends on assumption. Any other question? Is there any guarantee of a solution? Because this is a non complex problem. A guarantee is a yeah, we, we do an exhaustive search. So, yeah, we, we are getting the MLE guaranteed. So, you, you use another manner to guarantee mm -hmm. the solution? Yeah, we know that we are maximizing the objective function because we do an exhaustive search on the one dimensional non complex function. So, we basically can find the uh, maximum and quite fast. In your formulation, you want to maximize the likelihood so for the uh, zero norm into the minus that can be parabolic plus, right? Yeah, this is negative log likelihood. Oh, okay. So, yeah, we are minimizing this. Okay. How long does it take per sample? How long <coughs> does it take per sample? To run? It, it runs once you put all the sample together, right? It runs as a matrix of samples and take almost no time, it's like in seconds. So it's very fast. One more question? Thank you.